Hello, my name is Louise and welcome to Adventures with Yarn. This is my knitting and crochet podcast in which I usually talk about knitting and crochet. If you are a first time viewer, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to come check me out. And if you are an existing subscriber, thank you so much for coming back. If you like what you see, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. All right, so this episode is gonna be a little bit different than most. I do have some knitting to show you. I have a finished object and I have a works in progress, but this episode is going to talk a lot about what's going on in my personal life right now and um, my experience with contracting the COVID-19 virus. So hence why I am not in my usual place. Um, I'm coming to you live from my bedroom, uh, which does not have a lovely yarn background like my yarn barn does. But we'll get to that in a bit. So let's start off with showing you some knitting. I have my Luminary Socks by Helen Stewart of Curious Handmade. If you have watched um, the last couple episodes, you will know that these are the socks that I am making in honor of my dearest mother-in-law that passed away. I am making these out of Biff Sugar Yarn. Biff Sugar Yarn is one of my favorite yarn dyers ever. This colorway is called Courage and Kindness. It's very, very, very pretty, uh, light pale pink, with um, some specks of dark pink, some specks of um, just kind of varying specks of pink and almost to like a little bit of brown here and there. Just a little bit, but so very, very, very pretty. Just like all of Biff Sugar Yarn's yarn. Um, and as all of Helen Stewart's patterns, um, it is very lovely. I don't know if you can see these little star stitches on here. Um, I think with how the color of the yarn and with it being light, it's kind of hard for it to show up. But we have this motif up along both sides um, with a um, kind of a yarn over pattern that gives this lace kind of zigzag pattern up the side. And then you have the little bumpy star stitches in there. Um, I have a really pretty stitch marker, some little bells on there. This stitch marker I got as part of, um, oh, now, oh, now I'm trying to remember if I did get it. I either got it in the um, Hook and Light stitch marker advent calendar, or it could have potentially come on um, one of my mini skeins in the mini skein advent calendar that I had. I had an uh, advent calendar of mini skeins by Stu Yarns from Russia. Um, and every once in a while, some of the yarn had like a little something on it. So I did get a couple stitch markers. Oh, now I can't remember. But it was either one of those two. Um, so yes, this is a very beautiful and delicate pattern. I really love the combo. I love the combo of Biff Sugar Yarn and Helen Stewart's patterns because it just makes me feel fancy. <laughs> it, it just, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. They go well together. She has very lovely patterns that match this very, very lovely yarn. Um, and it just, I just love it. I haven't gotten a whole lot of work done on this because I was working on my sock madness project, which I had, I had over here. I must have set it down. Okay. Hmm, sorry. Um, okay, so we have a finished sock except for the ends have not been woven in. This is the Diamond Duality Sock. Whoa! Look at this thing. So I made this as part of Sock Madness. If you are unfamiliar, Sock Madness is, Sock Madness Forever is a group on Ravelry and Sock Madness is a sock knitting competition. 
Um, you basically, t in order to qualify, I had to knit up a certain pair of socks within two weeks and qualify to be put on a team. Um, and then within the team, you are racing to fill spots um, as you finish the pattern for each consecutive round. So this was for round one. I would say I did start off very strong, but then life kind of got in the way about the time I got to the heel. I think the deadline might actually be tomorrow or the next day for this to be finished, or rather for a pair of socks to be finished. Um, and as you, but as you can see, I just have the one. I just have the one sock finished. So I will not be um, advancing on to the next round, but honestly, I am thrilled to just have qualified to be on a team. Um, I will still get the patterns for the next few rounds. I had a friend tell me that, um, you know, if you don't qualify for the next round, if you don't make it onto the next round, then you could just pretend that you're still doing it. Like you can still try to make the socks in the allotted time because you'll still get the patterns and you still get to be in on the chat threads for your team. Um, so it's been a lot of fun um, getting to participate in those forums and talking with people who are also making the same sock. This sock, um, this sock is the first sock that I have made using stranding to get this color work going on here. Um, unfortunately, I think because of the stranding and how long this leg is in the pattern, um, I cannot put this on my foot. <laughs> I cannot um, fit my heel past this part right here. I have seen some people recommending, um, well, I have seen people doing several things. Some people are knitting the entire sock and finding someone with really skinny legs to give it to. Um, some people are knitting the sock for the competition and then ripping it back, or we call that frogging. Um, so that they can keep the yarn, use it for something else. Um, some people are redoing it so that it takes off um, the last couple diamonds so that your leg only goes to about here before going on to the heel and the foot. By the way, the yarn for this, isn't this beautiful, this green? I love it. Um, I did go ahead and hashtag the I like green socks and the green sock cow. Um, when I posted a picture of this sock, uh, of this sock, because of the um, green sock knit along that's going on, that is bringing attention to cyberbullying, um, and that it is okay to like green socks. Um, but this yarn was dyed by Zoe of Felicity Yarn Studios. She does have a podcast also if you want to look at Felicity Yarn Studios. She makes really, really pretty yarn. I really like her yarn. So I used her green um, aquarium color. And this is a tweed yarn from Knit Picks. Um, I think it is the Knit Picks Stroll. If I am not mistaken, I want to say the color charcoal but it has made a very lovely colorway. I just wish I could fit it on my foot. Maybe I will see if someone else can fit it on their foot and make the pair and give it away to that person, potentially. I don't know. Or I might just rip out the whole thing, which leads me to my next segue about the coronavirus. Um, for that reason, um, which I will get into, I haven't been working on projects that are specifically for other people. So I don't know. I have to figure out what I'm going to do with this. Unfortunately, that is it for the knitting portion of this podcast. And so the rest of the podcast, I'm going to talk about what's been going on. So I'm sure you guys are all aware of what is going on, this global pandemic of the coronavirus. COVID-19 virus. Um, I hope you guys are all staying well, healthy, safe, plenty of hand washing. I hope you're able to get plenty of groceries, things that you need, toilet paper. Um, 
So my story, I suppose, starts when uh, my husband, my sister-in-law, and myself traveled from Oregon to Arkansas when um, my dearest mother-in-law passed away suddenly and ex unexpectedly. That was in late February. Um, we flew over there right away because of what happened to be with um, my husband's father and um, be there for the funeral, which was very, very lovely. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when I leave work like that, I get um, a few days of bereavement pay and then I need to supplement my own PTO, which is my paid time off. I have so much. Um, and so I ended up using two weeks of my PTO to supplement my income at that time. Um, when we flew back, um, we flew through Atlanta and Seattle before arriving um, in Oregon. So we did go through international airports. Um, we sat on planes. Um, and uh, I think that is how my husband initially got sick. We came home and he was having issues uh, health issues. Um, I th we thought maybe it was his new medication messing with him. We thought maybe, maybe some of this is just anxiety driven based on life events that just, we had just gone through. Um, but you know what? My husband went to the doctor several times. Um, a couple times he went, he got some shots of antibiotics and sent on his way, but, um, was still sick. Um, he had a fever and we weren't sure if it was, you know, maybe some, his kidney stones messing with him or what. And, uh, the doctors didn't really know either. So he had been in and out of the doctor's office a few times. Um, eventually they swabbed him for the flu and he was negative. And so they said, well, we're going to swab you and test you for COVID-19. That is when my quarantine had to start. Um, if anyone in my household was being tested, then I myself had to stay home and not go to work per the guidelines of my employer, which is a hospital here where I work. Um, in case you're new, you're, um, I mentioned before that I am a nurse. Um, I work, technically I work on a med surge unit, which means medical surgical. So I take care of general medical, general surgical, but my unit specifically is dedicated to surgery patients. So I do work on a surgical floor. Um, I take care of patients who are admitted to the hospital after surgery. And so I kind of help them through the recovery process and get to send them home usually. Um, Anyways, that's what I do. So since I take care of patients uh, that we don't want to send home uh, sicker than when they came to us, that we don't want to potentially expose them, um, basically the guidelines, part of the guidelines were that if someone in your household is being tested, then you need to stay home um, until their test comes back negative or I think it was or for two weeks of quarantine. Um, so my husband got tested and he called me on his way back from the doctor's office to say that he'd been tested and I knew what that meant. That means that we have to quarantine him. He could have COVID. So I gathered up my essential supplies, basically some clothing, um, my um, uh, bathroom supplies, um, phone charger, anything that I knew that I was going to need, I took out of the bedroom and um, put it in one uh, in my husband's office so that he could be uh, quarantined in our master bedroom and bathroom and have that all to himself. So that's where we were. Um, we kept my husband upstairs 
quarantined, I would talk to him on the phone, I talked to him on FaceTime, we would deliver groceries, not groceries, we would deliver food, um, I would make food, prepare food for him and set it on the door, um, set it outside the door of the bedroom and knock on the door and set the food down and I'd kind of scratch the door to let him know that I was leaving and he could wait a little while before he opened the door to then pick up the food that I would leave for him. Um, we were very, very careful to just keep him sequestered. Um, I did, I did at that time, I did think that there could have been a possibility of me being exposed if my husband was being tested for COVID. If he ended up having COVID, that there was a very likely chance that I would have it as well. Because um, at least how we're treating COVID in the hospitals is that um, it is spread through droplets. So spread through coughing, sneezing, those droplets get put out in the air. They don't stay in the air, um, but they are in the air for a little bit before they fall. And if they're inhaled, that's how it's spread. Or if they're on a surface and then someone touches that surface, touches their face, that's how it's spread. But there are certain ways that um, the COVID can be put through the air. And one of those is if someone has COVID and they use a CPAP machine, that CPAP machine puts it all throughout the air. Well, my husband wears a CPAP machine and I sleep next to him as a lot of wives do um, in the bed. So I did know that there was a chance that I could have been exposed. Um, in the meantime, I was downstairs making him food, talking to him through the phone, trying to keep an eye on his health based on what he was reporting to me. He would check his temperature. He had a fever all the time. Even before he was tested, he had had a fever for like four or five days in a row before that. He kept having a fever every day. Um, as a nurse myself, I was just kind of watching, you know, as, as long as he wasn't having trouble breathing, I figured we were okay to stay home and just kind of try to treat his symptoms here at home. Um, I We ended up buying a little pulse oximeter, which can read oxygen levels. Um, and it was showing that his oxygen levels were not ideal they were low but not too low they just weren't ideal they basically were in the low 90s and in the hospital typically as a nurse we administer oxygen typically if someone's oxygen saturations are below 90 and he wasn't below 90 just at rest but it got to the point where he would feel winded just going to the bathroom um, just walking from the bed to the bathroom um, and so I had him put his pulse ox on and it showed that with activity, with moving to the bathroom, he was dipping down to about 86. And that was concerning. We um, we were on the phone with on-call doctors and I was just really at this borderline, do I take him in, do I not take him in? Um, I ended up getting um, instructed to take him in for a chest x-ray at urgent care. So he went to urgent care and they did a chest x-ray. Um, it did look like COVID. They were able to see on the chest x-ray that it looked consistent with COVID. Um, but at that time, they still felt that he was very borderline. Um, having me continue to keep a close eye on him, especially with underlying conditions like asthma, um, that we really wanted to be sure that he wasn't having any trouble breathing. Um, the next day, he was having more fatigue. He, like I said, he was dipping down into the 80s with um, activity. I called the on-call doctor again. I ended up getting the same doctor that asked us to go to urgent care for the x-ray the day before. Again, she kind of told me the same thing. Why don't you just hold on, watch him, just see. So, okay, same kind of thing. Um, half an hour later, she called me back. And she said that his case had been bugging her, especially in light of the chest x-ray results he had had the day before. So she asked me to take him into the hospital to get checked out. So I did. We happened to have um, some N95 masks here, um, just a few. Um, and I don't even remember really why. It's probably part of my husband's um, 
prepping. He has a few emergency preparedness kits. Um, so my thought was I'm going to put a mask on him to protect me and put him in the back seat of the car and drive him to the hospital. And so that's what I did. Um, we went to the hospital. I was not allowed in. Um, the hospital is pretty much on lockdown. No visitors at all. Only patients because they want to stop the spread uh, of potential COVID. So I dropped him off. That was kind of scary. I just kind of hung out in the parking garage waiting to hear from him to hear if he would, you know, just get treated and if I'd get to take him home or if he was going to stay and get admitted. Um, he was admitted to the hospital. He had to stay in the hospital four nights. Um, they did end up releasing him on the fifth day. During his time in the hospital, he was on and off of oxygen. He had um, received antibiotics and started feeling better. So praise the Lord for that. Um, and so he got to come home. Um, before they released him, his doctor did ask him to ask me to ask my doctor to test me for COVID-19. Um, especially because while my husband was in the hospital, his results came back and they came back positive for COVID-19, the coronavirus. So in light of him being positive and in also the fact that I am a healthcare worker, his doctor really wanted me to get tested if I could. There have been, um, certain criteria in the state of Oregon to get tested, um, especially because um, at the start of this pandemic, we were not able to process very many tests each day, um, but they were able to test me. They did take into consideration the circumstances and they did test me. At that time, I did not think that I had COVID, but I thought that I had a cold while while my husband was sick while he was in the hospital i had a stuffy nose um ever since we put him in quarantine i was sleeping on the couch or the air mattress and i had these body aches that i thought were because i wasn't sleeping on my normal bed um also you know i wasn't worried about myself i was worried about my husband so and Whatever I was feeling, it, it wasn't something I couldn't push through. Um, I didn't have a fever. I would check my temperature and I did not have a fever. Um, it's a good thing that I was home from work um, where I could have been spreading my sickness, but because of my husband's situation, I fell under the guidelines, like I said, to be quarantined. Um, but I went and got tested we continued to quarantine my husband um, upstairs in his bedroom. Um, and in fact, I, I had been away from him for uh, about two weeks, um, which was hard. I missed him is, you know, it's doable to sleep out on the couch and on air mattress, but you know, um, I missed him. I was pretty frustrated that um, I couldn't go back to work. I I thought I was following the guidelines of work um, to stay quarantined uh, for two weeks from my last exposure to him. I thought that I was protecting myself from being exposed by putting that mask on my husband for the ride to the hospital. My work did not consider that. Um, they considered that my last exposure and that extended my quarantine for another week, um, which I was not stoked about. Um, I honestly, I don't know that uh, a nurse would have done anything different. My thought process was how, in, how we transfer people with communicable diseases in the hospital. Um, for patients with COVID, we put a simple face mask, which is a surgical face mask, which protects from droplets. It's not protecting from airborne diseases. But when we transfer patients, 
um, in the hallways, you know, between rooms or between procedures, we put a face mask on them and they pass by people in the hallways that are not wearing um, PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, if a patient has an airborne disease or we think they could have an airborne disease like TB, we put an N95 on them to protect everyone else if we find ourselves in the situation where we're not putting masks on everyone else. I hope that makes sense. And that is the reasoning that I had for putting the N95 on him. So I was very frustrated um, when um, my employer uh, wanted to restart my quarantine. Um, also in light of the fact at that time, since Joshua, my husband, was doing okay, I was trying to figure out how I was going to recoup my wages from being asked to stay home. Um, and it wasn't looking good. Remember me talking about using my paid time off for the, um, for the bereavement leave? That left me with only one week left. And I was looking at missing at least two weeks, maybe three weeks. So I found myself being asked to stay home without pay. Um, which was kind of a scary situation. Um, I uh, had to file for unemployment. I could not file for short-term disability because I myself was not the one sick. So um, that was a little bit scary. Things are gonna be okay. Um, and I know many of you might be able to commiserate. I know a lot of people are getting laid off and a lot of people are gonna have to be filing for unemployment in this uh, scary economic time. Um, There is also, after I go a week without paid time off, there is a program in which I can ask my fellow employees if they would be willing to donate paid time off to me. So, um, so there is, <laughs> there is some hope. Anyways, so I got tested. My husband came home from the hospital. He was doing better and better, but he was still in quarantine. Um, and then actually yesterday morning, my test results came back, which was very surprising they came back so soon. I was told that it could be a week to a couple weeks. And I thought, I'm gonna be out of quarantine before I even know what my test results are. My husband's gonna be out of quarantine before we know what my test results are. It took him uh, more than a week to get his test results back. I got my test results back in four days. I got tested on a Thursday and yesterday was Monday. So it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, four days. I got my test result back and it was positive. Let me tell you what. <laughs> I didn't know what to think or do at first. Just like when we got my husband's results. I mean, he was so sick that it and and you know his his blood work wasn't showing anything else his his you know testing him for the flu and other respiratory diseases were negative we didn't so when you have covid it's you can't really it's hard to find what else is wrong so we thought it probably is but surely you know this isn't something that happens to us this is just something on the news that's out there you know um, he called me from the hospital, um, which is what he had to do. Like I said, there were no visitors allowed at the hospital. The entire time he was in the hospital, I couldn't be there. I had to FaceTime him. That was, you know, kind of nerve wracking. On the other hand, I was glad he was in the hospital. He was being taken care of by great, wonderful, wonderful nurses, um, that I, I'm so proud to get to work beside every once in a while. He didn't he didn't stay on my unit, but he stayed on another unit that I have been to. And I know he got wonderful, wonderful care there. Anyways, when he called me to say that he had that, all I could do was I slap my mouth and just like, oh my gosh. And that kind of was the same feeling that I got when they called me to tell me my test result was like, what? Um, <laughs> And in fact, I even forgot to ask that um, particular nurse what that meant for my quarantine and my husband's quarantine. Um, she told me that the county public health department would be contacting me soon. 
um, to let me know that I, um, to talk to me since I had a positive result and to kind of investigate where, how they think that I got it and, uh, you know, advise me on quarantine and such. So in a way, having the diagnosis, um, has kind of been a blessing in a couple ways. For one, I, I had those symptoms that I thought was a cold. I guess it was COVID and I got over it and I'm fine and I'm okay. That was my body's reaction and my body fighting it and getting over it, recovering from it. Um, they do not believe that I can be reinfected, at least with this current strain. So this gives me so much peace of mind. Um, <clears throat> whereas before, when I was working, before we were quarantined, uh, it's a little bit nerve wracking to have to gown up and take care of patients that might or might not have COVID. And now, I'll still wear protective gear, but I don't have to be afraid of infecting myself or bringing it home and infecting my husband. He's already infected and he is getting better every day. Also, the best part was since I was positive and my husband could not infect me, that I got to invade his quarantine. He was still quarantined in his room and had to stay there until he was symptom free for 72 hours. But because I tested positive, the county health department nurse um, told me, you know, they didn't think I could be reinfected. And so I could enter into my own bedroom and see my husband and, and go in there. So after two weeks of not being able to hug my husband, uh, sleep in my own bed, I was able to do that. Now, we do have to take some special precautions because I do still have two other people in the house. Um, we have my husband's father-in-law and sister-in-law staying with us, um, and they quarantined themselves within the house the same time I did, um, based on my husband getting tested. Um, after I got my positive test result, they did get approved to get tested themselves. Um, my father-in-law thought he was having allergies about the time that I was thinking I had a cold. Um, so he very well could have had it and is over it. And hopefully my sister-in-law is just so young and healthy that she just never even experienced symptoms. Um, you know, I, I have felt really bad thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, we were quarantined within the house, but if I, since I'm positive, maybe I exposed my father-in-law, my sister-in-law during this time. But as they pointed out, I mean, we were all on the same flight and we very well all could have been exposed whenever my husband was exposed, then exposed me. We'll see. We'll see how their test results show up. But, um... It does also help me recoup some of my wages. Since I now have a diagnosis, um, I can file for short-term disability and kind of have a, a um, I already had a reason to stay home, but it's just kind of through the paperwork. Now um, I may be able to recoup some, a portion of the missed wages. Um, and so, that's my story. Um, we are still planning on conducting the frozen knit along that starts next week. I have tucked away the prizes, um, even in the, uh, um, the, the prizes that have come in the mail, I haven't opened, um, prizes that have previously come in the mail have been tucked away, um, I'm the only one that has access to those and since uh, I've been in quarantine I've not reopened them so um, I'm trying to minimize any sort of risk of um, contaminating those prizes with any virus because my hope is to then mail those prizes out um, to winners at the end of the knit along which will end on May 4th. 
Um, so we're still going through with the knit along, but I want to be completely open and transparent with anyone um, that is going to be trying to win those prizes. And we'll take that on an individual basis too. So if you would like to join in on our frozen knit along, you're going to want to sign up on adventureswithyarn.com, which is a free website and platform. It's like a social media platform for crafters. You log on, you can make a profile, you can post pictures of your crafting, you can chit chat in groups and forums, um, you can make friends, all kinds of cool stuff, and you can join this knit along. Um, you're going to want to sign up on adventureswithyarn.com. You're going to want to find the Adventures with Yarn podcast group. And in that group, you're going to look at the discussions and there are the rules listed out for the frozen knit along. So for this knit along, I have teamed up with Amanda of Yarnanigans to, um, bring you some frozen themed yarn. I'm going to show some pictures here. This yarn is so pretty. I cannot believe that she dyed this all on her own. We have the colorway called Sisters, which is a um, gorgeous, gorgeous colored yarn. And then we have the self-striping colorway called Royalty, which is so, so pretty. I cannot wait to knit that up. If you use Amanda's um, Amanda's yarn. Now her yarn is sold on Etsy at Wallflower Gal Fibers. You can find it there. If you use her yarn, you will get extra points and extra chances to win prizes. If you use a different yarn, that's fine. There is no restrictions on the type of yarn. There's no restrictions on the type of project. Basically, it's it's frozen theme so this could be disney's frozen disney's frozen 2 which is uh released early on disney plus so if you have access to that be sure to check it out because that is a super cute movie um but also it could have anything to do with winter anything to do with snow and you know what it might be a stretch but it's kind of like our lives are kind of frozen in a way since we're all kind of staying at home like you could say you could venture to say that your social life is frozen whatever you just have to explain it in your entry and that'll get you an entry into the knit along um, and then listed on the website is a list of ways to earn points so there's all different kinds you can use the hashtags there's gonna be a hashtag frozen cal there is a hashtag wallflower gal fibers um, there is ways to earn points by posting pictures of your project, by uh, participating in the chat, all kinds. You guys, if you have been watching me for a little bit, um, I've hosted two other knit alongs and I really get a kick out of collecting prizes and giving them out to you guys. So I have some super cute prizes that are all frozen themed that I can't wait to give away. Okay. I think that is it for today. Um, don't forget, if you like what you see, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe. Um, I think that I will also include some news clips um, of my husband on our local news channel for your enjoyment and viewing pleasure. I hope you guys are all staying well and safe and healthy don't forget to be washing your hands soap and water at least 20 seconds ideally more um okay happy knitting happy crafting and i'll see you guys next time bye With 88 cases of COVID-19 in Oregon, hundreds in the state are awaiting test results. Tonight, I had a chance to FaceTime with one of those people, this man who's in Salem and says he's very sick right now under quarantine. He explains what he calls a very alarming testing process while sharing a message to those who might not be taking this pandemic seriously. They put me in a quarantined area that had yellow caution tape around it. Um, and then they gave me 
the test. And then I left through something that kind of looked like a third world city. It was like blue tarps and tents pieced together. 39 year old Joshua Lindley of Salem is stuck at home in quarantine. He's confident he has coronavirus and says now he's anxiously waiting for his COVID-19 test results to come back. Thursday was when the fever started and really bad like body aches, bone aches. It kind of has felt at times like somebody's just hammering my ankle or my arm. I have never been this in pain and this sick like this. Lindley is hunkering down inside of his bedroom with the door shut. They live under the same roof, but Lindley and his wife are using FaceTime to see each other. She is a nurse and can't return to work until they know his results. I can kind of hear them down there playing games sometimes and, you know, wish I could be with them. Um, they'll come and leave me food at the door, but I haven't seen another human in person, you know, since Monday. So it's definitely a tough thing uh, being quarantined. The other uncomfortable obstacle, he says, was taking the test itself. It was a really long piece of plastic. It felt like it went up and kind of curled around and then they twisted it and then they pulled it. And so I know I've seen some tests that look like they're maybe less invasive, but this one was pretty rough. And now his main message to take this pandemic seriously. The reality is that I don't know if I have it, but whatever I have, I'm sure is contagious and it has been terrible. You don't want this if this is the coronavirus. And the reality is, is this is an invisible uh, enemy. And I do want to mention Joshua says he took that test on Monday, immediately went home and into quarantine, but says he has no idea when he'll get the test results back. Uh, the people, he says, who gave him the test dressed out in that full protective gear told him it could be days or it could be weeks. So he's very concerned about that. He's also not sure how he got, uh, possibly got the virus. He says he did recently fly through Atlanta uh, and Seattle. So He looks a lot better, though, than he was, yes. right? He's turning a corner. He said today was kind of the first time he started to feel like himself. So great news there. Yeah.